Welcome to my channel. London, England. In his bed, a young boy sleeps peacefully. Suddenly, a shadow cuts across his bed sheets. The boy wakes to see a huge monster rising from under his bed, breathing fire and shaking the walls with his deafening roar. The boy is terrified. In Africa, a boy wakes up to see a fearsome monster charging towards him. The boy wails in fear. Around the world, similar events take place. We get the idea that monsters are terrifying children across the globe. Except in Belgium. A monster emerges from the boy's closet, but slips on a bar of soap into a basket of laundry and back through the closet door before the boy even has a chance to wake up. The clumsy monster emerges from the door, looks around to make sure nobody saw him, untangles a mess of laundry and clutter from his head and strides out into the workroom, grabs a clipboard, starts to fill out the paperwork. This is Johnson. His job, scare kids. He's not very good at his job, however. He uh, fills out his paperwork and ejects the door, which goes up onto an overhead track, where it's carried away to be refiled in the massive door vault. A copy of every door in our world is kept in this giant vault. This offers the monsters instant access to any child's room anywhere in the world. Johnson walks into an adjacent lounge area to turn in his scare report to the dispatch cage. And here in the lounge, monsters relax, chatting and playing cards while they wait for their next scare orders. Hanging on the wall is a Monster of the Month plaque. Johnson gazes longingly at the plaque, imagining the respect it brings to those who receive it. Looking at his reflection, he tries out a scary pose, but he hears giggling behind him. Johnson turns, sees a group of his co-workers. A sock is dangling from his horn. This is embarrassing evidence of his bungled scare. Oh, but the crowd hushes as Ned, the monster of the month for two years running, comes to Johnson's defense. Ned removes the sock from Johnson's horn, tells the others to lay off. Ned offers him a few scary tips on the side. Suddenly, a booming voice orders Johnson to the boss's office. The boss says, That last scare of yours is the worst I've ever seen! I should fire you right now, but I'm going to give you one last chance. The boss demotes Johnson to the minor leagues and gives him one week to redeem himself. He grabs a scare order off the top of the stack, hands it to Johnson. Start with this one. Anybody can do this scare. It's just a little girl. Mary is the youngest of 10 kids, all the rest of boys. Now her brothers make it their full-time job to torment her as much as possible. She dreads those attacks. Mary hates being scared. Johnson prepares himself doing his visualization and breathing exercises. He tries to be confident, but there is a lot at stake in this one. As Johnson enters the room and steps towards Mary's bed, the doorknob pops off in his hand. He fumbles around with the loose knob and turns to fix it. Mary wakes up, sees a large blue hunched over figure in a room, and thinks this is her brother's coming to scare her again. This is her chance to get back. She grabs her blanket, sneaks towards it, throws the blanket over the figure, and begins hitting it. Johnson stumbles around, flailing wildly, knocking over furniture, and quickly retreats back through the closet door and slams it behind him. Whew. Johnson emerges from the scare, tangled in junk. He rushes off to the locker room to tidy up. As he untangles himself, Johnson notices a tiny pair of fingers atop his head. A small human drops to the floor behind him. Johnson is horrified. Letting a human into the monster world is about the worst thing he could have done. For her part, Mary is very angry. She's sure this beast is her brother Paul in an elaborate disguise. However, she doesn't have time to investigate. Johnson quickly wraps her in a blanket, stuffs her in a locker out of sight from the co-workers. It's quitting time, so he has to try and act casual as he impatiently waits for the others to clean up and leave. But once the coast is clear, Johnson grabs Mary, tries to return her to her bedroom. But he tries to open the door, and the doorknob breaks off in his hand. A mechanic rushes over. After inspecting the mess, he hauls the door back to the shop. Mary is wiggling. Johnson doesn't know what to do. He has no choice but to take the kid home. Johnson runs through the city, a small bundle wiggling under his arm. Once in his apartment, Johnson panics. He has one week to prove himself, and he started by bringing a human into the monster world, a crime tantamount to treason. 
Mary is still sure that Johnson is her disguised brother. She attempts to prove this by removing Johnson's mask. Uh, but slowly, Mary realizes Johnson is not wearing a mask. He is a real monster. Mary runs for her life, screaming at the top of her lungs. Johnson's trying to catch her and quiet her down. Suddenly, they hear a thumping from below. Bam, bam, bam. It's the landlady. What's all that noise up there? Shh, 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 Johnson says, OK, look, Mary, if you want to get home, you're going to have to be quiet and do as I say. The two strike an agreement. Mary is pacified for now. The next morning, uh, Johnson tells Mary his plan. He is going to return to work, find a way to get her home, and she will stay in the apartment out of sight and quiet. Mary doesn't like this, but she has little choice. As Johnson's footsteps fade off down the hall, Mary decides to take matters into her own hands. She sneaks out into the hallway and is about to escape when suddenly she sees the landlady coming. She ducks back into the apartment, but the noise of the door closing alerts the landlady's suspicions. She knows Johnson is left. Who's in there? Her eyes are on these long tentacles. They snoop around the apartment. Who's in there, she asks as she's peeking around the corners. Mary is terrified. I'm not staying here, she tells herself. I'm, I'm, I'm going to find my own way home. Mary makes a disguise out of things she finds around Johnson's apartment. She makes a little monster disguise and sneaks out the window into the monster city. At the door repair shop at work, the mechanic has entirely disassembled the door and tells Johnson it's going to be a couple days before the door is ready. Johnson complains, but is interrupted by a telephone call from his landlady, who wants to know who's snooping around at his apartment. I'm going up for a look-see. No, 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 don't. I'll be right there. Johnson rushes home. On his way, Johnson nearly misses a small green monster passing the other direction. He realizes that it's Mary and catches up to her. Mary is furious demands to be taken home immediately. His apartment is no longer a safe hiding place. Johnson has no choice but to take Mary to work while he figures out what to do next. At work, Johnson tells Mary she can't go home until her door is repaired. In the meantime, he has to keep working to avoid suspicion. She should wait outside the door, as Johnson explains, as it'll be too scary inside. But Mary demands to come along. Inside the kid's room, Mary watches, unimpressed with Johnson's pitiful attempts to scare. I can scare better than that, she tells herself. Disgusted, Mary takes over the scare, terrifies the kid. The scare rates extremely high. Johnson feels threatened by this success. Mary feels a thrill of retribution for her years of brother's mistreatment. This is her chance to scare someone else for a change. Mary continues to scare kids. She's having a great time. In fact, Mary gets a little carried away. She dreams of new, innovative scare techniques, scare props. Johnson isn't sure he likes this. He's becoming nothing more than Mary's assistant. The boss congratulates Johnson on his success. Keep this up, Johnson. By the end of the week, you could be Monster of the Month. Ned hears of Johnson's success, and his true colors show through. Feeling threatened, Ned vows to do whatever it takes to keep his title as top monster and put Johnson in his place. By now, the two have developed a lingo for their scare routines. Uh, let's do an A-B with a reverse twist, Mary says. I'll go get the prop fangs. Upon arrival of the door, Johnson enters the kid's room to scout around a little bit beforehand. Suddenly, he stops. Something about this room looks familiar. It dawns on him. He's standing in Mary's room. The door's been fixed, and now he can send Mary home. But the thought of being without Mary frightens Johnson. How can he possibly become Monster of the Month? without her there to do his scares. Leaving the room, Johnson sees Mary returning. Quickly, Johnson removes a telltale drawing from the front of the door, hides it from her view, and ejects the door just as Mary returns. The new door arrives, and the two move on to the next scare without Mary noticing a thing. Over the next couple of days, the successful scares continue. Everything is going great. But then one night, Mary enters the kid's room to do a scare. She pulls back the covers and comes face to face with a little girl. Everything about this whole situation reminds Mary of home. She becomes homesick. She can't bring herself to continue the scare. She turns to leave. Confused, Johnson follows her. Surprise! The whole company turns out to see Johnson awarded the Monster of the Month. The boss presents him with a plaque. Everyone cheers. Having lost his title, Ned is furious. As the revelry continues into the evening, Mary sits alone, feeling incredibly homesick. As she wipes a tear from her cheeks, she removes the monster disguise glasses. Ned's eyes nearly pop out of his head. Johnson has been harboring a human child.
Johnson and Mary return to his apartment. Mary is jolted out of her depression when she finds her drawing. Clear evidence now that Johnson had access feels betrayed. How long have you had that door? Were you ever going to let me go home? Angry and bitter, she runs out of the apartment. Johnson is left alone, holding his Monster of the Month plaque. He'd wanted this award his whole life, but now, surprisingly, it doesn't mean anything compared to his feelings about the kid. Johnson runs out after Mary. Mary is nowhere to be seen. She's lost somewhere in the teeming Monstropolis. Johnson comes across bits of Mary's costume, which Mary had shed in her furious run. He follows the trail and runs into two old ladies reporting the sighting to a monster police officer. Oh, it was awful. It was cute. And, oh, it was disgusting. At the boss's office, Ned relays his discovery. Johnson has let a human into the monster world. The boss grabs his robe, afraid of how the company will look, should word of this leak out to the monster public. In Johnson's apartment building, the landlady's favorite evening television program is interrupted by news of a human loose in the city. A reward is being offered for its capture. The landlady calls the police to report a tip. Johnson passes a television store, sees the televised bulletin. Your human is considered cute and dangerous. A manhunt is underway. Mary is feeling lost and very frightened. Her anger spent now, she can't even find a way back to Johnson's apartment. Even things that seem familiar to her are not. The monster world comes alive, closing in on Mary. She finds herself in life-threatening danger. Just as things look hopeless for Mary, Johnson arrives to save the day. The two decide it's not safe for Mary to remain in Monster World a moment longer. She must get home immediately. Making their way back to the scare factory, Johnson and Mary break into the high-security door vault. They turn on the lights to reveal a mammoth room full of millions of doors. Frantically, they search to try and find Mary's door. It's like finding a needle in a haystack. They're about to remove Mary's door from the track when everything begins to move. The door track has been activated. Johnson chases after the door. Mary's hanging off of it. Soon, Johnson discovers who it was that activated the door. It was Ned, determined to expose Johnson as a fraud. Ned and the security guards chase after Johnson, who in turn chases after Mary and the door. Johnson grabs a hold of the door. He and Mary are able to steer it into the workroom. They ride the door to one of the stations, security close behind. They plug in the door, activate it, and inside is Mary's room, snug and warm. Tearfully, they say goodbye, knowing they'll probably never see each other again. Suddenly, in burst the security guards, Ned and the boss. Johnson, with a human, yells the boss. Ned was right. Get him, boys. Quickly, in an attempt to save Mary, Johnson ejects the door. But in his haste, the door remains open as it ejects. Mary's room is seen through the doorway as it swings from the track overhead. Security closes in on Johnson, arresting him and dragging him away. Mary sees her friend in trouble and has one last-ditch idea to save him. Timing it just right, she loosens the bolt atop the door, causing it to fall from the track. It falls towards the ground, heading straight for Johnson. The security monsters scatter in all directions. The door completely envelops Johnson and smashes into a million pieces on the workroom floor. Back in Mary's room, her brothers are up to their old tricks. However, Mary is no longer frightened by her brother's taunts. In fact, Mary has a little surprise for them. It's Johnson, her best friend, who now lives in her room. Her brothers are terrified, and Mary enjoys a much happier childhood. Even years later, Mary and Johnson still enjoy scaring each other. They live together happily ever after. The End